Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Market Matters webcast, Investor Update. Now, this Investor Update is titled, How We Intend to Maximise Returns for 2016. Now, we're pretty close to the end of 2016, so we think this is imperative uh, for people to take note of. Okay, first and foremost, just a little bit of housekeeping. Now, you'll, be, uh, you'll need to use the sound on your PC, uh, obviously, and headphones are advised if you do have some. Uh, obviously, they're not essential. Uh, you can ask questions via the toolbar, and during, well, most, we've got some time for Q&A at the end, uh, where we'll answer your questions. Uh, on, there is the off chance we could answer something ad hoc, but most likely at the end, we've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Also as well, a recorded version of the web webinar will be made available after today's webcast and will be sent via email. If that copy somehow does not find you, please give us a call on the 1300 number, 1300 301 868, and we'll, be make, we'll, we'll make a copy available for you. Also as well, just a disclaimer, Remember the information in this presentation is of general nature only. It does not take into account the investment objectives, financial situation, or the needs of any individual investor. Now before making an investment decision, we recommend that you consult with your financial advisor. Now just quickly before we kick, it off, kick things off and go over the webinar topics, I'd like to welcome James Gerrish, who's joining us today. Oh, Nick. G'day, James. Now, James has joined Market Matters oh, over a few months ago, and we're thrilled to have James on board. Uh, James writes a lot of our content uh, and has a lot to do with our macro strategy. Uh, thus, we thought it was imperative to get him along today uh, and cover these key issues that we've got listed right here. Now, we're covering six topics today. The first topic is macro issues driving markets. The second topic is key commodities and what is our view. The third is understanding bank earnings. And James will really go into depth here on how the bank earnings, well, what makes up bank earnings and why the banks have been performing well recently. The fourth is key portfolio calls. And we're really going to highlight some of the calls that we've made over the last few months. The fifth, so we're going to give you three ideas that we like right now. Uh, some are, you know, quite good buys. Some are, you know, not, not really worth a look. Um, and lastly, we're going to try and put our, um, you know, target cap on and see if we can pick where the index is going to be at year's end. Now, first and foremost, let's kick off the first topic. And the first topic is what the macro issues that are driving markets. Now, James, the key issues that we've been highlighting in the reports is US rates and inflation, uh, which is going to set the tone where interest rates are going globally. Uh, obviously, we've got the election in the US, which you, know, you could argue is a bit of a sideshow. Uh, but the key theme is rates in the US. You've talked a lot about it in the reports. Uh, take us through you know, what you're seeing from a broader macro standpoint. Um, and you know how you're really sort of looking out over the market um, and formulating a stern view. Yeah, thanks, Nick, and good to good to uh, uh, be here. I think I'll just set the scene uh, initially around where the market is um, and where it's been over the last 12 months because it's been a pretty difficult uh, investing environment, uh, to be completely honest. If you think about the ASX, uh, our market uh, as of uh, yesterday, over the last 12 months, we're up about 60 points which is a pretty anemic effort. Uh, the US market, the S&P 500 is up around 3% uh, as of last night. So, you know, one of the, a couple of the major things that are, that are driving that indecision, if you like, um, in global uh, equity markets is this push and pull between uh, growth and yield. Um, global growth has, has been slow. Um, it's being supported somewhat by monetary policy, by central banks globally um, taking measures to support growth. Uh, post the GFC, uh, but we're really not starting. We're not, we're not seeing a, a massive uptick in global growth. On the other hand, we've got uh, yield, and yield's been a, a wonderful place to be 
uh, from a market's point of view in the last few years. Um, but we're now at this precipice that uh, the US is likely to start raising rates. Uh, interest rates globally have probably bottomed out. We've probably seen the low in interest rates here uh, in Australia. So, you know, that that, that concern or the, the changing trend, that's what's got investors a little bit uh, uh, cautious um, at the moment. And, and there has been indecision and there's likely to continue to be indecision. So, you know, the way we've been approaching the market, the way we're thinking about the market is around being, you know, a little bit more active in our mm -hmm. sector allocations, a little bit more active um, in, in trying to time the market, in trying to be in the right sectors at the right mm -hmm. times. But I think it's the other important thing is not being in the wrong sectors mm -hmm. Uh, at the wrong time. We've seen that. We'll go through some examples uh, later on, Nick. Yeah, I have to say, James, you wrote a great report the other day uh, that highlighted that fact. First of all, you know, Telstra up 18% to start the year, then down 16%. So if you held it for the whole year, you're only up 2% plus dividends, whereas if you, you know, played some of the ranges, you could have made more money. Now, I've got the S&P chart here. Now, market matter view uh, on interest rates by year's end in the US, what what is that? Are we expecting to see a rate hike in December? Yeah, I think it's a pretty foregone conclusion. I mean, there's been, I think the Federal Reserve in the US has missed a few opportunities of raising rates pre the election. They won't do it in November because of the circus, which is the election over in the US. Uh, December is, is the likely uh, time that they'll raise rates. I mean, the market's now at 70% probability. That's priced in to the futures market. So it's not going to come as a huge surprise. We were sitting at about 60% a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the market is getting um, uh, comfortable with, you know, higher interest rates over in the US. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the next chart we'll look at very shortly is around, you know, long-term interest rates over in the mm -hmm. US, where they've been and where, they're, where, where they are now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that puts it in the context. A 25 basis point increase in interest rates coming out of the US isn't substantial. Mm -hmm. It's not... You know, it's not massively tightening financial conditions. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're on our road back to normality. Uh, so I think it's going to be a sensible thing, particularly around the Fed keeping credibility and, and, and delivering what, what the market is anticipating. So, you know, in our mind, we're, we're primed for an interest rate hike in mm -hmm. December. Nick. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Now, yeah, as you've said, here's the long-term interest rate charts in the US. As we see, like, literally as close to zero as possible, coming off a very low base and, you know, I guess if we do see them go up in an orderly fashion, we're coming off such a low base that equity markets shouldn't be too spooked, uh, but probably will create opportunities. Oh, yeah. I mean, higher interest rates are, are a negative for equity valuations. If you're looking at how you value an asset, um, you know, you put in the risk-free rate as a valuation mechanism. So as an input into valuation, lower interest rates allow you to come out with higher valuations for assets. So, you know, rising interest rates are not necessarily a good thing. They will be, the market will take it fine if it corresponds with, um, you know, some sort of um, uptick in growth. Mm -hmm. So if interest rates don't go up too quickly um, relative to the mm -hmm. growth that we're seeing, um, then the market will take that, uh, you know, reasonably well. But it, 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 again, it comes down to, you know, in the equity market, um, we've got to be conscious of the lack of alternatives mm -hmm. from you know, an asset allocation perspective. There's not a lot of um, options out there from an investment standpoint mm -hmm. to go out there and get returns. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting time mm -hmm. for markets. The indecision will continue and that's why we're sort of, you know, that, that, that's why we think market matters can help in terms of, you know, uh, actively a allocating assets, being in the right sectors mm -hmm. at the right times, et cetera. So that's what we aim to do. Awesome. There's the next one here. There's, you've just got the steepening of the yield curve here. Now, obviously talking about how, uh, you know, this is changing quite a lot at the moment. We probably will go more into depth in, in the coming days, I assume, writing a more formal report on something like this. But in layman's terms, obviously, for the investors at home, uh, are you able to, you know, explain? It's, it, look, it's, it's, a, it's a concept that we've spoken about in reports in the last few months, so I thought it would be worthwhile uh, covering it off somewhat in, the, um, in today's presentation. So, you know, the steepening of the yield curve is just around long-term rates going up more so than, than shorter term rates. So um, if you think of a two year uh, yield, if a two year yield sitting at 2%, mm -hmm. um, a, a 10 year yield um, uh, uh, sitting, you know, 35 3.6%, it's that the relative movement in the long dated yields versus the short dated yields. And I'll touch on it a little bit further because yep. it's relative to, or relevant. Some opportunities. Well, it's relevant for bank earnings. Yep. So, you know, if you think about a bank, 
a bank um, borrows short and lends long. So, you know, I'll, I'll touch on this more in, in, in detail later on. But if you think of a term deposit, you might get 2% out of your term deposit. That's what the bank pays you. Um, so that's the cost to the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, they're lending on a mortgage book, you know, somewhere around 4% at the moment. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're borrowing short and lending long. Mm -hmm. So naturally, if that yield curve is steepening, yep. so longer rates going up more so than short-term rates, banks tend to benefit from it. Fantastic. Now, just here we've got the Australian interest rate futures at the moment. Now, you're on Sky Business for, oh, I think, about three hours today, James. You must be exhausted. Thanks for fronting up for the webinar. But market matters, our view, um, is quite different to you know some of the people out there in the media on rates. Uh, now, what is that view moving forward? What are we expecting with rates? You know, obviously, we've got a race decision coming up on the Melbourne Cup Day, or is it the day after? Melbourne Cup Day. Melbourne Cup Day, so, you know, next Tuesday. Yeah, well, our view, rates are bottomed here in Australia, and you mm -hmm. can you can see it from the chart that's um, on the screen there. The chart looks at expectations back on the 30th of, of September, the 7th of October, and the 14th of October. So, you know, it's it, I listen to economists out there, and there's, you know, some of the major banks are still... Uh, factoring in another rate, um, uh, another rate cut here in Australia, the market's simply not pricing that. So we've gone from a situation where interest rate cuts um, uh, were still on the table. If you look at the green line around the 30th of September, um, uh, we're still thinking, you know, we're still the market was still anticipating interest rate cut. Now that's not the case. So interest rates are no longer going down in, uh, here in Australia. Um, you know, one of the major things that um, may have a bearing on that is inflation data mm -hmm. tomorrow. Um, that's one, you know, one one issue that may raise its head. But mm -hmm. you know, from a market's point of view, from our point of view, interest rates here in Australia are bottomed. And mm -hmm. you know, for those with a with a with a mortgage, house mortgage, yeah. me included, you know, it might be it might be uh, worthwhile fixing. Considering it at least. Awesome. So that covers the macro topic. Uh, the next thing we want to talk about is key commodities and what's our view. Uh, now. On this, you know, Market Matters came out at the start of the year and said this is probably the first time to hold mining stocks in the portfolio as an investment as opposed to a trade, which is historically what we've done in the past. Now, some stocks have really, really performed well this year. You know, Fortescue being one, it's gone from the low of a, you know, the dollar forty odd to had a phenomenal day today, up around that five thirty mark. Um, but I guess the key theme here is you can't just throw a blanket over the commodity space like you did at the start of the year. So what you've got here is individual commodities. I'll just flip to the chart. Uh, now, James, this is commodities 2015 versus commodities 2016. Uh, can you explain, first of all, the charts at the top, which include you know underperformance and outperformance, and then the two at the bottom after that? Yeah. Um, just to, I mean, uh, briefly, is, uh, from the outset, I mean, each commodity has a different um, push pull factors and that's that that comes down to you know that's reflective in the, their prices so there's a lot of it's a complex market commodities there's no doubt about it um, back in 2015 which is the chart performance of commodities on on the left hand side of the screen there you know that, that was a weak performance oil was down nearly 40 percent iron ore was down nearly 40 copper and gold were weak as well we've had a big resurgence in the commodity markets in 2016 um, led primarily by iron ore um, gold is pretty close behind. So, you know, commodities have had a, a big resurgence. One of the things I would say is that you know, it comes on the back of a lot of negativity around commodities. You know, the iron ore price has, has been, you know, sitting around sitting around $55 a ton. Mm -hmm. uh, futures are up 6% today over in China. So that's why we've seen some positive uh, flow throughs uh, for iron ore stocks today. But, you know, the commodities are you know, we, we, we spoke about being active, we spoke about being passive. We've still got to be a little bit active in yep. commodities. Mm -hmm. A lot have had a good run, some haven't. So we're focusing more so on the ones that haven't had a okay. particularly good run. Fantastic. Now, the next chart, you've got a copper chart here. Now, we haven't really been too active in the copper space. Uh, you know, our key theme here is, you know, there's still global oversupply. Yeah, there is. I mean, copper's been a pretty difficult place to be in the last um, 12 months. We haven't been there. We've been negative on copper, and that's pretty much been reflected in the stocks we've held, you know, we haven't been holding copper stocks. There is still going to be, you know, global oversupply of copper uh, for the next 12 to 18 months. That's why, you know, when we've seen money move from, um, you know, not being in commodities to being exposed to commodities, mm -hmm. we haven't seen copper bounce. It's, you know, it's, it's bounced marginally, but mm -hmm. you look at the chart there, it's still very much in a downtrend and we're not seeing any reason to be upbeat on copper. Mm -hmm. um, that said, a lot of the diversified miners have some sort of 
copper exposure, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, they're not large parts of their business. And the only, you know, the, the biggest pure play copper company Sounds on the like. uh, uh, on the ASX are um, uh, Oz Minerals. So, okay. you know, Oz Minerals is, is a little bit different. You could, you could probably make a case that Oz Minerals is worth looking at, even though the copper price has further to fall, only because it's got such a big cash balance. It's about $500 million on its balance sheet. Uh, which is the biggest um, cash balance of any copper producer mm -hmm. uh, in the world. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's got some optionality to it. But, um, you know, copper for us, it's, it's, it's all too hard. We'll yeah. revisit in, a, revisit in six months' time. If an opportunity arises. So the next one's iron ore. You've already touched on this somewhat. You know, towards the start of the year, got back to 36-odd, I think, 38.30 on the chart. I see it there. Uh, people were calling it down to 25. It's since bounced. Obviously, China <coughs> is a bit of a Pandora's box as to what's going on there. Um, you know, we've been in and out of Fortescue. You know, are we looking at anything shorter term, or what's our sentiment towards the iron ore space at the moment? Pretty much, the whole market's got iron ore wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. 192 is its high, and we've mm -hmm. seen it come back all the way to 38 dollars. So, yeah, there's been uh, when prices are really high, a lot of production comes online. When mm -hmm. prices drop, everyone scurries to um, cut production or lower costs, etc. Mm -hmm. So. Now, iron ore is difficult at this stage. We we're, were more bullish when it was nearer to $40. Mm -hmm. We've gotten more neutral on it now that it's closer to $60. Okay. So um, neutral in iron ore at the moment. But I've got to say, some of these iron ore uh, companies have done spectacularly well mm -hmm. um, reducing costs. Fortescue, for instance. I mean, that was a highly leveraged mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, iron ore play. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's done particularly well. It was risky at $1.50. Um, it's less risky now, but there's probably less upside now. <laughs> Fantastic. So the next one, we've got crude oil now. We've currently got a position in Origin, which has had, been going okay recently. We're in and out of Woodside. Uh, oil's had a really good bounce recently. You've got two charts here. I'll just go to this one as well. Um, first, of, first of all, you've just got the oil price. I'll just uh, talk to the oil price initially. I mean, yeah, and then yeah. second of all, you've got the, um, the seasonality. So just get you to cover both of these. Oil price, I think the, the big macro drivers of the oil price have been, you know, um, uh, OPEC, Saudis, uh, Russia, etc. cetera, wanted the oil price lower to put mm -hmm. pressure on US shale. They've done that. Um, there's now a lot of talk um, that OPEC will cap production. Um, Russia is supporting that move. Um, you know, they probably will. They, if, there's, if there's intent to get prices higher, um, then it probably will. So, you know, prices are likely to go uh, higher from here. Um, we've got a $60 target for, for oil. Uh -huh. um, I will caution that, and it, and it is going into this next chart around seasonality. We're very big on seasonality. If you, you know, if we tie back into the comments we made initially around, you know, markets that have been fairly muted over the last 12 months, we need to be getting our sectors right mm -hmm. from a seasonal perspective. So that's what we're aiming to do. Mm -hmm. Oil is seasonally weak in November, early December. Um, you can see the next chart that you can flick to there, Nick which shows the seasonality of oil. So, you know, week at the back end of the year, the start of the year is, is, is strong for oil. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, you know, that's something we, we take in consideration mm -hmm. when, we're, when we're recommending, um, you know, what to do in certain, you know, sectors and, and whether or not to have oil exposure at any one time. Fantastic. So just to um, consolidate here, and just a question for you, actually. The oil price, well, the oil price used to be in the 80s, 90s, even even got to 100 at one stage. Are those days gone? Will we ever see that again? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you look at two things. You look at global growth, which drives um, demand for oil. Global growth is going to go through a period where it's going to be fairly lacklustre. There's a whole, whole <laughs> heap of reasons. We could have a whole presentation on the outlook for global mm -hmm. growth. I won't bore you with it now. So that's one side. And, and, and production has uh, ticked up. Um, uh, pretty markedly, uh -huh. you know, US has come online and they're now energy self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. So, no, Nick, I think those days are gone. So, you know, $60 is our target. If it goes to $60, we'll become more neutral mm -hmm. um, on oil and probably reduce some of our exposure to it. Fantastic. So, next chart, keeping with the commodity theme, is gold. Now, we've done well on gold in the past. You know, our outlook piece did say we we think that the yellow metal was going to rally two to $300 this year. We've seen it rally, you know, $250, $300 off its lows from the start of the year. Been in and out of Regis. I know you've got some favourites that you're keeping your eye on. How are you playing the gold space at the moment? Yeah, look, looking to go and buy gold at some stage uh, in the next, you know, in the short term. The issue around gold is, you know, gold is heavily impacted by what the, the US dollar does, the US currency. Um, we've got a situation now where um, the US is going to raise rates, in our view. The market thinks they're going to raise rates, but they're only about 70% certain. 
So if we get to the situation where um, you know, the expectation of US interest rates firm over the next couple of weeks, the US dollar will uh, go up and we're looking on the dollar index. So this can be some levels to keep an eye on. We're looking in the dollar index to trade up to 102. It's trading around 99 at the moment. If that happens, um, then the gold price should be dipping around um, $1,230 an ounce. If that does play out as we're anticipating, we'll then go and add some allocation to gold in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about stocks uh, no doubt in the yeah. future. So I have to say, people out there, people that subscribe to our service, it can happen very quickly with gold as it has in the past. You know, we bought Regis and you know, seen some quite decent gains over a short period of time. So watch out for those alerts when they do come. Uh, as I said, it can happen quite quickly. Now let's kick on to the third topic, James, and this is understanding bank earnings. Now this is quite a busy chart we've got here. Uh, we have you know, the funding composition of Australian banks and capital ratios, major banks net interest margins, and we also have what PEs the space is currently trading at. If you want, can you, are you able to delve a bit deeper and explain to the investors out there uh, what's going on here? I'll probably, I'll probably bore you with this. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go too much in detail in this. I think the biggest, you know, metric. And I was talking to Mike Hurst, the uh, the uh, MD of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, uh, today about this. Um, the concept of how banks borrow and how they lend. So, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, you look at the deposit, the domestic deposits there, funding composition of banks in Australia. So, in Australia, the the majority of bank the the Banks are majority funded through deposits. Mm -hmm. So you go out there and put money in the bank and they lend it out. If you're going out there and putting money in the bank, you might be getting a 2% return on the money. Mm -hmm. um, that goes in your pocket, but that's a cost to the banks. Mm -hmm. If they're going out there and lending that at 4% and higher rates for more risky exposures, then they're making a margin. The issue in a low interest rate environment is that the, the margins tend to get pressured. So um, if, you're, if you're looking at a... Um, yeah, if you're uh, by pressure, I mean, yeah, if we're sitting at two percent on mm -hmm. on uh, on t TD rates, the average home loan rate is at four. You know, in in an increasing interest rate environment, the home loan rate goes to four and a half, but the term deposit rate goes to two two point two. That helps the bank's underlying margin. Mm -hmm. That helps the bank's underlying earnings. So mm -hmm. I think that's the 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 one of the first points to make. Mm -hmm. The major bank's net interest margins is the chart down the right hand side of your screen. Yeah. You'll see, you'll start to see an uplift in net interest margins. So if you go back to the year 2000, as this chart does, we had higher margins on um, on banks, and that improves their their earnings. Mm -hmm. The other important point I'd make, Nick, is around capital ratios. Yep. So we've had a lot of we've had a lot of um, uh, talk uh, in recent times, a lot of regulatory rumblings around you know banks needing to hold more capital. Yep. They are mm -hmm. so banks are needing to hold more capital. That's being dictated to them by the regulators. Yep. If you hold more capital around um, uh, uh, that you're lending, then the returns on that lending decline. Yep. So that's what we've seen in the banks at the at, at the moment. So mm -hmm. you know the PEs there, banks are trading at twelve and a half times on a, on a sect, you know, from a sector point of view, which is cheap relative to the market, and mm -hmm. it's probably too big a discount. But I guess the main takeout I'd make here yep. is around is around uh, you know the trends in earnings. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of negativity around bank earnings. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say here is that potentially bank earnings have bottomed mm -hmm. and it's going to improve for yep. them. So I'll leave you with that, Nick. Fantastic. So let's kick on to let's kick on to the next chart. This is bank performance versus the index. Um, in, now we've got. I'll, I'll pick out the, the key points here, Nick. Okay. So monthly performance. So I want to. You know, we've had a very overweight allocation into the banks mm -hmm. um, over the last little while. It's yep. a chart uh, on the right. So. Now, October is a seasonally strong month for the bank. So since the year 2000, we've got an average return of the banking sector of 4.02% since the year 2000. So now that's the, the biggest takeaway I want to give here. So um, in November, though, it's one of the worst performing months um, uh, for the bank. So mm -hmm. now that ties also into um, the monthly performance for the ASX 200. Yep. October is a really strong performing month uh, for the index, 1.7%. Is the average um, uh, monthly return for the index? So mm -hmm. we've had 12 up months, four down. So 75% hit rate in in in, uh, in October, mm -hmm. but cautious around um, you know November. Yep. November is a you know, fairly soggy month for the bank for uh, the market generally, and, and indeed the banks. Awesome. So this ties beautifully into what we're going to cover next, Jan. We've got three of the big four coming up. I guess I just want to get you there cast your view quickly on these. So first and foremost, ANZ, we last averaged that under 24. 
uh, it was only there for not too long when it last reported, uh, well, quite a few months ago. Um, What's your stance on this? What yeah, we've, uh, as I said, we've got a lot. We, we had an overweight position in the banks in our portfolio. Um, at the height, we had 52% of the portfolio yep. in banks, if you include Suncorp. Mm -hmm. we've, so, we've sold Bendigo at the back end oh, about a week ago after it um, paid uh, its uh, one ex-dividend. So, yeah, ANZ we still like. We mm -hmm. will be selling it into strength. Yep. So, you know, we've got ANZ, um, Westpac, uh, CBA mm -hmm. in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to trim our bank exposures yep. in the strength. Mm -hmm. One of the big things around ANZ was, you know, it's, it's capital position. Mm -hmm. So, you know, banks, um, banks bottomed out a couple uh -huh. of months ago. ANZ's been the best performer yep. because it's made most Bridging inroads. Up. Well, it's made, it was the cheapest. Mm -hmm but it's made most inroads uh, beefing up its capital. So, okay. you know, capital is going to be a really important thing for the banks going mm -hmm. forward. Any, like, is there a target level that we're looking at that, like, obviously this can move with the market, but is there an ideal level we'd love to get out? Yeah, we've penciled in above $30 at this stage. Okay. But, it, again, you know, we look more at seasonality and we've got, mm -hmm. um, what are we, we're coming to the back end of October now. Yeah. So, you know, ANZ's been the best performing bank. So, mm -hmm. you know, that right now, that's the one we'll be trimming out of. Okay. Fantastic. So next one, CBA. In the reports recently, we're talking about selling it over 77. Uh, you know, underperformed recently. It's had a good bounce in the last sort of month uh, with the other banks. What are we seeing there? Is there a target level we'd like to get out? Yeah, a bit, a bit of a PE re-rate. CBA trades at a big premium from a from a valuation perspective to the other banks. You mm -hmm. know, I'd argue that's warranted. Mm -hmm. It's a better franchise than the others. They've got better systems. They're, you know, they're, they're better managed, etc. So, you know, $77 is our target in CBA, mm -hmm. but you've got to look at it in the context of the portfolio. Yep. So, um, you know, $77, if we're looking solely at CBA, um, then, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the target there. Fantastic, yeah. No, we have indicated that we're looking to get the higher levels of cash you know, over 5.7, and, you know, I guess everything can potentially be on the chopping block if it hits our price target. Oh, exactly. You've got to be nimble in this market. Yep. So, you know, people reading our reports will know that, you know, we can change our view on things. We can change our mind on stocks. It's a... It's a fluid market. Rolling, that's what we're rolling with the punches. Well, exactly right. That's that's the whole you know that's the whole way you approach markets in this sort of environment. Mm -hmm. We've got one in here that we don't own. Nab. We've included it because we know a lot of people are attending probably do own it. Uh, similar sort of outperformance. Did you say to ANZ recently compared to like the other yeah. the other two of the big four? Yeah. You, you, you well you get more you'll get more info um, from Nab. Um, on Thursday, that they release results. So, I mean, the biggest concern about NAB is going to be around the dividend. Um, consensus sits at that they're, they're going to maintain their dividend, mm -hmm. but you know, there's some uh, there's some analysts I've read out there that are calling for a cut in dividend. You know, the, the payout ratio is sitting at unsustainable levels. Okay. So, they've either got to grow earnings more or they're going to cut their dividend. Yeah. So, you know, NAB to me, it's, it's cheap. It's cheap for a reason. Um, it'll be, you know, I'll be very much uh, interested in what they say come Thursday around their dividend and the sustainability of their dividend going forward. Okay, fantastic. And I'm sure we'll be covering that when that comes out. Okay, just lastly, we've got the S&P and banking index. I'm assuming you've got this in here just to show how we can get a technical read globally, um, you know, almost like an overlay. So it's part of the reason why we've been bullish on the banking space here. Yeah, we tend to look at what's happening in the US as a guide to what's happening here. And, and the banking uh, index has been you know, very strong over in the US. It's been strong because of that steepening yield curve that I was uh, uh, highlighting earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when, when the yield curve starts to steepen, it's mm -hmm. a tailwind for bank earnings. So, you mm -hmm. know, if you take one thing out of this presentation, yep. it, it, it's that. So, you know, we first got keen to go overweight the banks by looking at what's happening in the US banking mm -hmm. um, sector. Um, it still looks positive. We're still targeting six to eight percent higher yep. in U.S. banks, so mm -hmm. that keeps us reasonably positive in the banking uh, space mm -hmm. over the, over the uh, you know, in the foreseeable future, notwithstanding the weakness here in November. So it'll prompt us to keep some mm -hmm. bank exposure, yep. but not be as overweight as we are now. Fantastic. So looking to lighten the load into strength, still relatively bullish. Uh, you know, I don't think the world's about to cave in tomorrow. Um, but yeah, as, as you've kept on reiterating, looking to sell the strengths. Now let's kick, kick things along. Next topic is the key portfolio calls. I'm just going to take everyone through our portfolio and some of the calls we're making at the moment. Um, now we'll try and speed things up here so we can get through everything and don't run out of time. Uh, firstly, James, just got the portfolio composition here. As you can see, you've talked about this just before. We are pretty overweight the banks, you know, 44%, but that's for good reason. Um, just take us through this makeup quickly. Yeah, banks, so 44% now. We were at high levels, so we've trimmed one out of the portfolio. You know, health is one of these things that we've just added. We'll touch on health scope that we added to the portfolio. 
um, post the downgrade uh, at the back end of last week. Um, you know, tourism, we like the tourism theme. You know, we've got a small exposure in materials at the moment. We want to increase that exposure in materials. Energy, again, in the weakness into November, seasonal weakness, we'll look to increase our energy exposure. We don't, um, uh, um, you know, the cash levels at 9% is about right, but we want to increase those cash levels. So um, that's pretty much what we're doing there, Nick. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And yeah, I guess we've got our sellers cap on, but opportunities do always present themselves, don't they? Yeah, we've been, I mean, you, you read the weekend report and I've been talking about, you know, selling into strength. We've got our sellers mm -hmm. hat on. Um, we haven't been doing a, a huge amount of selling yep. uh, as yet because the market's been strong. But that, that that's the, you know, that's the, the approach we're taking and that's, you know, things think work out over time. Yeah, okay. So okay. that's, our, that's now, our position. Just quickly, we're about to skip to the next slide. Just quickly, cash 9%, James. Uh, in the past, we've been as high as 40 or 50% cash. Never probably gone quite 100% cash, but wouldn't be against it if we have to. We don't have a mandate where we've got to have an allocation to the market. Now, how important is cash in investing, do you think? Yeah, cash, cash is important. I mean, it's, it's a little bit harder to go to high cash levels um, at the moment given interest rates are so low. Yeah. But, you know, I, totally not adverse to increasing cash substantially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, our longer term view is this market's going to peak out um, after making a new new high over in the US, it'll drag our market up. So, you know, this one, you know, one sort of blow off top that mm -hmm. we've been talking about uh, in reports for a while now, that's what we're anticipating. And if we do see that happen, then we'll, we'll happily go to, to uh, more significant cash levels. So I think that's mm -hmm. one way we help invest investors. Mm -hmm. We're not simply going out there, putting buys on stocks right across the market. Yep. We're, we're actually managing a real portfolio of real cash, yep. um, you know, allocating it um, uh, accordingly to how we're writing reports. Yeah, it's, not, so, it's, not, it's not monopoly money at the end of the day. No, it's not. There's no. There's not endless amounts of money out there. So we've got to manage a portfolio yeah. with the constraints that mm -hmm. an everyday investor would have. Yeah. So we can't buy everything under the sun. We've got, we've got to be quite nimble with our capital, as James said. Now, next we've got three. I think we'll cover these together just to keep things along. We've got Westfield, Sydney Airport, and Transurban. Now, when we did the last webinar in June, we did talk about how Sydney Airport will drop a dollar sometime in the next six months. And lo and behold, if you look at it, it has come back a dollar. Um, now sitting around that 659 mark. Now you've included this in our key portfolio calls. Um, now do you just want to explain these three together? Because you've got they're yeah. quite similar. I yeah. guess it's not Based about, it's not just about uh, looking at what to buy, we're also writing about what not to buy, what sectors not to be involved in. So you, know, you can broadly put these things, Transurban Sydney Airports, yeah, they're, 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 they're great companies, no doubt about it. They've been you know, great businesses that produce great cash flows. They've been great for investors over the last couple of years, but they've run up too, too far relative to their earnings and they've really been supported by low interest rates. You now, these are infrastructure stocks that have high debt levels. Um, when interest rates go up, the cost of servicing that debt goes up and that's what puts these you know, companies under pressure. Mm -hmm. I think Westfield was a really key example there. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's a property stock, as, as most probably know. Yep. Um, it, you know rising interest rates um, are, are, are a major negative for a stock like this. Um, people, you know, investors out there, and we've seen it in the last couple of weeks where it's dropped pretty substantially, there's been a buy of the dip. Mm -hmm. So people naturally will go in and buy weakness of a stock that's yep. performed really well over the last couple of years. <laughs> We've had, you know, what technical term is dead cat bounce, yep. and now we're rolling over again. So, you know, our, we're cautious in this sector. We're not as negative as mm -hmm. we were, but I, I think it's still a sector to avoid for now. Okay, yeah, and as you said, look, look at this chart here. You've got our initial target is $9, but we'd ideally buy it at $8.50. Now, like we've seen with gold in the past, like we don't always stick to that. We can roll with the punches of the market. If the risk was not there, we're not always going to enter, are we? Yeah, I mean, we, we we present a view. We've got firm views. We present mm -hmm. it, and sometimes those views uh, uh, can change. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, you've got to be nimble in this environment. Mm -hmm. So you know, Westfield, we it's it's a stock that I couldn't get excited. I couldn't uh, yep. get keen to buy at this mm -hmm. stage. I wouldn't put my money into it. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be writing to for our subscribers to put theirs into it. Okay, fantastic. So next thing, next we've got Origin. Uh, we've talked about oil before, and we have talked about Origin. Uh, here we've got potential ABC target for Origin is seven thirty four. Uh, yeah, take us through this portfolio call that we made, or well, we've been holding for quite yeah, some time had, now. Actually, probably it's a been a pretty, it's been thanks, Nick. It's been a pretty frustrating position. You know, we're we're up on it now. We weren't up on it um, uh, the whole time. I mean, this is playing our positive call on the energy space. Um, we've had Woodside in the portfolio in recent times. We 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 ticked out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to have energy exposure in there. You know, the, the, 
the key call is that I think the market's underestimating what Origin is going to earn if oil prices stay where they are or go higher. So mm -hmm. now it's not the case across the board in energy. You've got to be a little bit careful. Mm -hmm. Analyst expectations of the oil price are more optimistic than the oil price is at the moment. Mm -hmm. So you need to be very cautious in the energy space at the moment, but we think Origin uh, is a good pick. Um, and you know, notwithstanding the weakness that we think will play you know, in the sector that could play out in November, we'd be looking to increase our energy exposure into any weakness. Okay, fantastic. Now, next thing we've got is Hellscope. Now, this is our most recent acquisition. Had an okay day today, back at 228, owes us about 233. Uh, you know, the market threw up a good opportunity at the back end of last week to get in this stock. Uh, we're slightly down on it, but um, you know, happy to have a health position in the healthcare space now. James, what presented the opportunity to buy this stock, and what are we seeing here? Yeah, it's about. I mean, healthcare sector generally. I mean, we had CSL in the portfolio; we've still got that. Um, it's about going into this season, this concept of seasonality. So, healthcare typically performs well at the back end of the year. Um, so, we wanted to increase our exposure there. We highlighted HealthScope before the drop. We've been looking for it into into, into weakness. Um, you know, the numbers they delivered on Friday were pretty poor, but they're not ref they may not be reflective of the whole year's uh, earnings. So mm -hmm. for now, we're happy with the risk reward that Hellscope presented to us. We probably bought it a day early, but you know, um, such is life. We're, 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 we're there or thereabouts. We're happy with the exposure. Uh, and from a risk reward perspective, we're pretty comfortable with that. Okay, fantastic. So next one is Newcrest. Now, we were talking very recently that you're considering a position in Newcrest. Uh, it's been holding up relatively well, and the gold price has sort of potentially found a base around that 1260 mark. Uh, you know, what are we seeing here? Uh, just quickly for everyone that's listening. Yeah, we're, we're, look, we're looking to buy Newcrest. We're looking to buy it, put a gold name in the portfolio, whether it's Regis Resources, uh, Newcrest, Evolution looks pretty good to me as well. So out of those three, we are looking to put a, a gold name in the portfolio. As I said, look for the dollar index to break, break out to a new high, 102. It's trading around 99 at the moment. That should correspond with gold around 12.30. Uh, if that takes place, then we'll look to allocate some uh, money into Newcrest. Um, again, it's the US dollar that's going to drive the gold price in the short term. Okay, fantastic. That brings us to the next section. Now, we've got investing ideas, three investments we like right now. Uh, in the market, and we'll just, just cover these one by one. Now, Mantra, one that we own, I'll own it from about $3.30. Uh, you know, obviously, as we've talked about, Airbnb threat overdone, aging, well, the rise of the Chinese middle class. What are we seeing there? You know, what's our target? Will we still buy it today? Yeah, it's a growth stock with a reasonable, you know, on a reasonable valuation. So, no, we definitely still buy it today. Uh, it's run up a bit from where we've bought it. I think one of the interesting things, this has been a, a big short position starting to uh, shorts have ticked up a lot in, in Mantra, and you might say, well, that's a negative thing. People are viewing this in, uh, as a negative play, but if a stock can rise, even though shorts are building, it shows some really strong underlying strength for, 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 a, for a stock like Mantra, and that's mm -hmm. why we're seeing it. Um, yeah, that's why we're positive on it. It looks good on the charts. The underlying business is sound, so we're happy with it. Okay. Do you have a price target on that? What are we thinking? We can get into the fours. It yeah. was at $5 not that long ago. Yeah, you'll see this stock could rally pretty quickly in a short amount of time, if shorts fall on their sword. So if shorts you know, capitulate, fall on their sword, you'll see it up over $4 in a pretty short amount of time in my view. Okay, fantastic. Next one, we've got ResMed. Uh, now they've got the AGM tomorrow. Uh, you know, Obviously, we've already got a position in HealthScope. We were all also contemplating selling a bank to maybe buy another healthcare company. Is this one, is this one that is on the radar? Yeah, we like the look of ResMed. I like the earnings stream of ResMed. I think it's got you know, it's a good growth um, stock. I think, as you may mention, of the AGM tomorrow, it probably renders it, you know, we, we probably wouldn't go in and buy a stock ahead of its AGM, given the landmines that we've seen mm -hmm. um, through this through this AGM season. So it's certainly one we've got on the radar. We'd be buyers at these current levels, depending what the AGM uh, throws up tomorrow. So we're trading around $8, you know, $45, $8.50 at the moment. So certainly one to, that uh, is on our uh, watch list uh, pending the AGM tomorrow. Okay, fantastic. Now, next one we've got here is the Star Entertainment Group. We've talked about this in the reports as a you know, potential buy. Obviously, there's a lot going on with Crown, which has dragged this whole sector down. One on the radar, one that we're looking at getting in yeah, shorter term. I mean, it's Crown. It's not just Crown. It's what's happening in China. It shows yeah. what you know, it shows the risk of uh, buying a business that's exposed to Chinese regulation. Yeah. And we've seen it. Yeah, we, we've seen it across the board in in other areas as yeah. well. So the Star we wrote this. We wrote. Uh, last week we'd be buyers under $5, it's mm -hmm. 5.07 today, it's ticked up, it's ticked up a bit today. So, you know, that's the level that we'd be buying it at, it's a high risk buy, you don't know what the Chinese are going to do, but 
typically in situations like this, the first reaction gets overdone. So yeah, we're not we 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 came out on the day that uh, all of this broke and said stand back for now, mm -hmm. um, uh, and we've done that. We haven't bought any yet, but something um, yeah, we're looking around that sub five dollar mark. Nick. Okay, awesome. Now you got one more here. First wave cloud uh, FCT mm -hmm. is the ticker on that. Now this one a bit of a this one a bit of a spec, a bit smaller, not one that we actually own as market matters. Uh, it's a spec. It's a spec one I wrote about um, a few months ago, just in an afternoon report. It's a it's cloud-based security solutions. They've got to deal with Telstra, which makes it you know pretty attractive. They've got you know a good runway of growth over the next uh, few years. So it's certainly one to keep uh, on the radar. Nick FCT, you know, sub 100 million dollar market cap, and you've got to have you know we're, we're, you know we, we we typically talk about large large caps. It's nice out there to you know have the odd speculative yeah. uh, company that is likely to have a catalyst for near-term earnings. Okay. So what I mean by that is, you know, they're going to earn money. They're not they're not going to go from capital raising to capital raising. So certainly one I like, Nick. Okay, fantastic. Now, next thing we're going to try is, uh, yeah, where to for the index? Uh, now, probably a two-fold question. Let's do it this way. Now, you know, obviously the, the year is only well, it's going to end in just a little bit over two months. Where do you think it'll be at year's end? Obviously, we've got the U.S. election, rates in the U.S., and you know, where do you think the index will track leading into next year? I think we'll probably have a year end around 5,700, Nick. I mean, I, I base that on. You can go out there and put all these sorts of targets on the index, and it probably means very little in in the whole scheme of it. But you know, the index um, base that on a, a seasonal strength um, in the back end of, uh, of December. What typically happens going into an election is you have markets that are fairly muted. We've had that. We've had that here in Australia. We've also had that here. Um, uh, we've also had it over in the US in, in you know, pretty lackluster performance over the last year and more so in the last couple of months. So you get a relief rally, particularly if we have a Clinton victory. Um, you're likely to get a relief rally of somewhere between you know, 4 and 5% towards the back end of the year. You know, going forward, our view of the market is that we're going to have some sort of blow off top, particularly in US equities. US equities, you know, the US market cash is still very high. You don't mm -hmm. get market tops when cash is so high, or you don't typically get market tops when cash is high. So, you know, this is the this is the the, the theme or the you know the the path of of most pain as we've written about in recent times, mm -hmm. where US stocks go and make a new high. The Aussie market goes and makes a new high. If we're going for a ten percent gain in the US, that filters through to a, you know to something you know, around that six thousand level on our market, and that's when we'll be getting more bearish on our market. Okay, fantastic. Now we have now come to an end of the webinar, and we've got a very very small amount of time for some Q and A. Uh, this has actually run slightly over up around almost that forty five minute mark, which is what we budgeted for. Uh, Probably got time literally just to take uh, one question. What we're going to do with the rest of them is we, we will address them. We will give you a phone call uh, tonight, ideally, worst case, tomorrow morning. Uh, but there's just one here, James, talking about uh, will, and we have covered this slightly, but let's let's answer this one a bit more uh, closely. Will Market Matters buy gold search soon? If so, what are we looking at? What are we looking at buying and why? Yeah, three. We are we are looking at gold stocks. Nick, three things: um, uh, Regis, Newcrest, the Revolution. Three gold stocks we like. Um, I just I touched on it before. You know, we're going to be dictated to or guided by the US dollar. If the US dollar, as interest rate expectations sit, you know, they currently sit around seventy percent for a December hike. Uh -huh. If that goes close to eighty percent, um, then we're likely we're likely to see a short-term top in the US dollar. And then there's expectations around you know, interest rates next year change. So you know, the US economy is not doing uh, as well as, you know, it, it's, it, the growth doesn't warrant a sustained increase uh -huh. in interest rates over a long period of time. So a US dollar short-term spike, gold a short-term low. Mm -hmm. When that happens, we'll go and allocate some uh, uh, cash into the gold space. Okay, fantastic. I think we've got time for one more. Now the next one we've got here is, are there oil stocks you like? Now we own Woodside, Moved out of that. We own Origin. Um, you know, is there anything you're looking at? It's a bit smaller. Yeah, we like. I mean, we like we we like Origin. The smaller space beach looks um, looks reasonable. If you go down the, the spectrum, um, you know, then it it increases the risk. Carnarvon is one that um, we've brought. You know, that, that I keep an eye on, and that's that's a reasonable smaller um, energy play. I think there's a couple of things. You know, Santos has got some issues around its balance sheet. 
Um, uh, that's you know, a concern in my mind. Origin is balance sheet is okay, so that's why we've got um, Origin in the portfolio. Woodside is sort of X growth. They've mm -hmm. got you know they've got to go out there and make acquisitions to fill that growth pipeline. They've um, you know that's a void in that growth growth pipeline in the years to come. So um, oil search is a, a, a good prospect as well. The PNG LNG project is coming along pretty well. Mm -hmm. They're going to increase production over the next few years. So. You know, oil search to me—they've just got the overhang of the PNG government with a large stake on in, in that project, so or in that company, I should say. So, you know, once they, yeah, Origin for mine at the moment. Um, and if you go into the, you know, from a seasonality perspective, mm -hmm. we'll be looking to increase our energy exposure, but not now. So going into you know, the back end of November, early December—that's the time to do it. Okay, fantastic. Now that pretty much brings us to the end. We've got one more slide for you, but just quickly, I just want to thank you James for your input today uh, it's been great to you know I guess verbally communicate what we're seeing in the market at the moment and I'm sure this is the first of many webinars we'll be doing uh, moving forward so thanks for coming along and donating your time after a busy day on Sky Business thanks Nick happy to be here okay so just lastly guys viewers out there what we've got on the back of this webinar and on the back of the changes with the business uh, that are happening moving forward is we've got a special offer for you now, as if you look at the screen right now, it says click here to take up this offer. You can't actually click that, but you will be able to click a link um, that should show up on your screen once this webinar ends. Now, we're happy to give you quite a substantial discount on a one-year deal, uh, a discount of $150 uh, to take on board the service. Now, this is the full platinum service, which includes everything from the real-time alerts with the follow-up emails, access to the website, to the portfolio, morning reports, afternoon reports, weekend report, and also the account management where you can give us a call anytime you like on the 1300 number and ask questions about the reports. Now, for the investor that sees himself in the market longer term, we're actually giving you more of a substantial saving on a 36-month proposition uh, where, yeah, obviously, you, know, you can lock it in and not have to worry about anything for the next three years. Uh, and if history repeats itself, uh, who knows what can happen. Now, uh, remember investors, this may also be tax deductible. I know, it's, I know June 30 is not around the corner. However, um, you know, it is something that we get a lot of investors calling us up around that time of year. So just remember that, keep that in mind. Now, uh, my name is Nick Forsyth. I'd like to thank everyone for coming along and attending today, uh, taking time out of their busy lives and their busy days. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. If there's anything that wasn't clear today, feel free to give us a call on the 1300 number. That's 1300 301 868. That was 1300 301 868. Uh, we'd love to have a chat with you. Conversely, if you email your account manager or if you email info at Market Matters, uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, we will be hanging around for a little bit late, a little bit tonight for the next couple of hours. So feel free to give us a call if you want to have a chat. Have a lovely evening all.